This presentation is brought to you by Pocket Oracle. The definitive pocket reference to Oracle. After this session, you should be able to outline the Oracle architecture and its main components and list the structures involved in connecting a user to an Oracle instance. An Oracle server consists of two entities, the instance and the database. They are separate, but connected. The instance consists of memory structures and processes. Its existence is transient, in your RAM and on your CPUs. The database consists of physical files, on disk. Thus the lifetime of the instance is only as long as it exists in memory. It can be started and stopped. By contrast, the database, once created, persists indefinitely, until you deliberately delete the files that compose it. An Oracle instance is a means to access an Oracle database. It always opens one and only one database. Consists of memory, the SGA, the fundamental component of an Oracle instance, the PGA and background process structures. Let's see them in detail. The shared pool is further subdivided into a number of other structures, the library cache and the data dictionary cache. The library cache is a memory area for storing recently executed code, in its parsed form. Parsing is the conversion of code written by programmers into something executable, and it is a slow process that Oracle does on demand. By catching parsed code in the shared pool, it can be reused without reparsing, performance can be greatly improved. The data dictionary cache stores recently used object definitions, descriptions of tables, indexes, users, and other metadata definitions. Keeping such definitions in memory, rather than having to read them repeatedly from the data dictionary on disk, enhances performance. The database buffer caches Oracle work area for executing SQL. Users don't ever update data on disk. They copy data into the database buffer cache and update it there, in memory. Ideally, all the data that is frequently accessed will be in the database buffer cache, therefore minimizing the need for disk I.O. It's managed through an LRU algorithm. The log buffer is a very small memory structure used as a short-term staging area for all changes that are applied to data in the database buffer cache. The primary purpose is recovery. Changes recorded within are called redo entries. Redo entries contain information to reconstruct or redo changes. The large pool is an optional area that, if created, will be used automatically by various processes that would otherwise take memory from the shared pool. It's used for session memory, the UGA for the shared server, I.O. server processes, backup and restore operations or our man, parallel execution message buffers. The Java pool is required only if your application is going to run Java stored procedures within the database. It is used for the heap space needed to instantiate the Java objects. However, a number of Oracle options are written in Java, so the Java pool is considered standard nowadays. The sizing of SGA memory structures is critical for performance. In general, they should be large enough, but not too large. In addition to wasted memory, performance can degrade if too much memory is assigned to the SGA components. The program global area is the memory reserved for each user process connecting to an Oracle database. It's allocated when a process is created and deallocated when the process is terminated. It's always used by only one process. The user process is a program that requests interaction with the Oracle server. It's started at the time a database user requests connection to the Oracle server. It must first establish a connection and does not interact directly with the Oracle server. The server process is program that directly interacts with the Oracle server. It connects to the Oracle instance and is started when a user establishes a session. It fulfills calls generated and returns results and can be a dedicated or a shared server. The background process is started when the instance starts, maintains and enforces relationships between physical and memory structures. The mandatory background processes are DBWN, PMON, SMON, CKPT, LGWR. There are also a number of optional background processes. Some of the background processes can be tuned. For example, you can decide how many database writer processes to launch, and you can to a certain extent control how frequently they will write chained data box from the database buffer cache to the data files. SMON major function is opening the database, enabling the connection between the instance and a database. 
Its responsibilities include instance recovery, roles forward changes and redo logs, opens database for user access, rolls back uncommitted transactions, coalesces free space and deallocates temporary segments. PMON looks after user sessions, taking appropriate action if a session gets into trouble. Its cleanup activities include rolling back the transaction, releasing locks, releasing other resources and restarting dead dispatchers. The DBWN process or processes is responsible for all writing to data files. It writes when checkpoint occurs, dirty buffers reach threshold, there are no free buffers, table space operations and backup operations. The LGWR propagates all changes applied to data in the database buffer cache to the online redo log files on disk. In contrast with DBWN, this disk write activity is done as near as possible in real time, at commit, when one third full, when there is one megabyte of redo, every three seconds and before DBWN writes. The CKPT process is responsible for ensuring that, from time to time, the instance is synchronized with the database. In principle, the database is always out of date, there will be changes that have been applied in memory that have not yet been written to the data files by DBWN though the changes themselves will have been streamed out to the online redo log files by LGWR as they happen. There are occasions when it is necessary to force a write of all changed data from the database buffer cache to the data files, to bring the database write up to date. The CKPT process controls the frequency of this. Also updates data file and control file with checkpoint info. Three file types make up an Oracle database, along with a few others that exist externally to the database and, strictly speaking, are optional. The required files are the control files, the online redo log files, and the data files. The external files are the initialization parameter file, the password file, and archive redo log files. Every database has one control file, but you can have up to 10 copies of it. The control file is small, but vital. It contains pointers to the rest of the database, the locations of the online redo log files and of the data files. It also stores information required to maintain database integrity, various critical sequence numbers and timestamps. The control file will usually be no more than a few megabytes big, but you can survive without it. The data files are the repository for data. Their sizes and number are effectively unlimited. The data files are the physical structures visible to the system administrators. Logically, they are the repository for the segments containing user data that the programmers see, and also for the segments that make up the data dictionary. Every database has at least two online redo log files. The online redo logs store a continuous chain in chronological order of every change applied to the database. This will be the bare minimum of information required to reconstruct or redo changes. The redo log consists of groups of redo log files, each file being known as a member. Oracle requires at least two groups of log files and at least one member in each to function. In this session we learn to explain Oracle instance and the database, the SGA memory structures, the primary and optional background processes and the primary and optional database files. For a quick reference of Oracle concepts visit pocketoracle.blogspot.com.